News of the day. Mr. Zimmerman, have you made a decision as to whether or not you want to testify in this case? With values that never die. There are certainly a lot of controversies or scandals brewing right now when it comes to the Obama administration. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Dealing with the federal government is not always high tech and it's not always user friendly. The stories that matter. This is a massive escalation in the tension here in Egypt. The issues that count. I don't know why the media tries to make this into a sensation. We have never hidden the fact that we supply Syria with weapons. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. He's got the red, white, blue, fine high on a farm. Semper Fi tattooed on his left arm. Spend a little more. Welcome to American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I'm your host, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. Please go to that website. It has some remarkable stories, including a regular column by yours truly. We have so much to discuss today, as there was a lot of news that broke this week. The most important is a rather surprising move by the Republican Party. This week, uh, the House leadership issued a memo which outlined their plan to cooperate with the Democrats to try to get immigration reform. How dumb is that? You have a president right now that is on the ropes. His policies are failing, and the American people can clearly see that. His poll numbers are dropping like a stone. And instead of just keeping the focus on the president's failed policies, the Republicans are about to play a very poor hand, one that threatens to divide the party and snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Um, you know, it's it's unbelievable to me. It's absolutely shocking. If I were advising them, I would say, you don't have to do very much this year in order to secure victory in the Senate. Just keep the focus on Obamacare like a drumbeat. Be disciplined and stay united. The party is already quite divided as it is. Don't do anything that will highlight or exacerbate that division. And instead, what do the Republicans do? They come forward after a retreat with a memo, a memo that outlines the principles of a new policy or they're going to try to get some kind of a bill on immigration reform. Well, I want to read to you a couple of the provisions that really struck me. If you look at the first one, one of their first principles is that this country needs border security. So I quote from the memo, it's the fundamental duty of any government to secure its borders and the United States is failing in this mission. Yes, that is correct. And what a remarkable statement that is. I mean, what country can say that, that it's failing in the mission to secure its very borders? Just that one statement requires debate and discussion that can consume the rest of the president's presidency. Never mind everything else the Republicans are going to try to do with this. So they then go on to say this. Let me quote. We must secure our borders now and verify that they are secure. And I'm asking myself, okay, before we get any further down this memo, tell me how you're going to secure the border. Tell me how you're going to do that. And unless you can tell me how you're going to do that and how you're going to verify that the border is secure, I'm really not interested in reading anything else. Because we've been talking about securing the border now for a couple of decades, and it's not getting done. And the only thing that's happening is that you have wave upon wave upon wave of illegal immigrants. And the one thing you're really concerned about is making sure that you give some kind of documentation to the ones that are already here illegally. So unless you can clarify how it is that we have failed so badly in one of the primary responsibilities of a government, which is to secure its border, unless you can tell me how you're going to secure the border and how you're going to verify that it's secure, I'm not interested in discussing this issue any further, period. Because you know what? Just to try to get to the bottom of these two statements, the two parties will be at loggerheads until the end of the president's term, never mind trying to do anything else. And if the Republicans do want to do anything on immigration reform, it comes with one simple sentence. We want to secure the nation's borders, 
Period. Don't talk to me about anything else until that is done. And you know, if they said that, they would have a winning issue, but with the base of their party and with the American people. Instead, they are talking about they're going to possibly secure the border. And then they're going to implement a new visa tracking system. And then they're going to try to get employment verification. Ah, but here's the nub. A couple of paragraphs down. They want reforms to the legal immigration system. They want to help the youth who are here, uh, who are brought by parents who bring them here. So therefore, they want to give those youth, youth, undocumented youth rights. And they want to help the individuals living outside the rule of law, not by giving them citizenship, they say, but by giving them some kind of a legal status. I don't care about all the other provisions you have on this memo, because unless you pass a bill or several bills to secure the border, and unless you have the funds to prove to the American people that the border is secure, this issue is not to be debated or discussed. That is my position, and I think the American people would support that. The rest is a bunch of blah, blah, blah that will get us nowhere. In fact, it threatens to blow up the Republican Party at a time in which we do have the chance to seize the Senate if we remain united. Well, Senator Cruz was asked what he thinks about all of this talk about uh, immigration reform, and this is what he had to say. Roll it, Brittany. Well, Peter, I think it would be a mistake uh, if House Republicans were to support amnesty for those here illegally. In my view, we need to secure the borders, we need to stop illegal immigration, and we need to improve and streamline legal immigration. As you know, one issue I fought very hard for is increasing H-1B visas. I introduced an amendment to increase the number of temporary high-skilled workers, H-1B visas, fivefold, from 65,000 to 325,000. Every Senate Democrat on the Judiciary Committee voted against that. I think those are the sort of reforms we ought to be looking at on immigration, securing the border, improving legal immigration. Amnesty would be a mistake. You got it. Amnesty, legal status, any word you want to use to describe it is a colossal mistake. And it is true that we do need to improve the legal immigration process. As a person who went through it, I can tell you it is costly, it is cumbersome, it is long, it is inefficient. But that's quite typical of what government does. Yet, even more, more pressing, more urgent, more dire than doing anything at all is to make sure that the government of the United States fulfills the most basic, basic duty of all, which is to ensure that the nation's borders are secure and the nation's sovereignty is protected. Our failure to do so is a failure of colossal proportions. It's not a small oversight. It's not a small transgression. It is major because it is gradually destroying this country. It is undermining the rule of law and it is gradually eroding our sovereignty. Unless we get to the bottom of this, we cannot do anything else. And Pat Buchanan had some very strong words in a recent interview, words of warning and words of prophecy. In the first place, he outlined exactly what it will mean for the Republican Party if we go down this road. Roll it, Brittany. Well, I think what you said about Boehner is probably or almost certainly true. You've got the Chamber of Commerce and the big business folks want the immigration deal solved. They want a lot of their business guys off the hook who've been hiring the illegals, and they want to be able to hire the illegals themselves. And uh, But if Boehner has signed on to this, behind, even behind closed doors, he's going to have to come out into the open. And Barack Obama will have effectively driven a wedge right through the Republican Party. You will have a war inside the Republican Party, a Balkan war this year, which will knock it off its present game, which is to lay out the problems with Obamacare and show the American people that liberalism is a failure. 
dead on Pat Buchanan. And, you know, he said in that clip a couple of really interesting things. One of them is that you really have big business that has been driving this agenda for so many years. You know, the pages of Wall Street Journal are rife with reports about how we need to get this done. And essentially, they're doing the bidding of big business when they say that. But, you know, the Republicans have a really golden opportunity by resisting immigration reform to champion themselves as the protectors of the little guy, the little guy whose wages are corroded, whose opportunities are reduced because of this wave of illegal immigration. The Republicans are always asking themselves, well, how can we win the next election? How can we splinter the Democratic Party and divide up their coalition? Do you know, African Americans really, on the whole, are opposed to immigration reform. And one of the ways you could try to peel away support by African Americans for the Democratic Party, for example, is to say, you know, this wave of illegal immigrants hurts African Americans. And is this right? And why don't we champion their cause? And you could peel away many blue collar workers and, uh, and, and those who do not have a college degree, who are so dependent upon the variations of the marketplace, you could win all of those voters that often gravitate towards the Democratic Party. So it is a stupid, stupid, stupid electoral strategy to give away all of these possible tools in your arsenal by standing firmly against immigration reform, let alone that the base of the Republican Party can't stand the idea of immigration reform. And then Mr. Buchanan said something else. If we do this, we are driving a wedge right in the middle of our party. We are going to embark ourselves upon a Balkan war, a fratricidal war, a bitter, ugly war. There will be people within the party who will be crying out, break it up, go third party, and that will destroy any chance we have of regaining the Senate. I have to ask this question, why now? Why on earth is Boehner thinking of doing this now? If this isn't treachery, if this isn't sabotage of the Republican brand and the Republican Party, I don't know what is. And that's why Buchanan is very astute when he said, if he tries to go through with this, there will be a revolt. Because enough is enough is enough. You know, when I was working with the families of Navy SEAL Team 6, and they were on Capitol Hill asking for Congress to look into why that crash occurred in Afghanistan in 2011 and why our elite boys died, the family member said to me, you know, Dr. Gray, so many people on Capitol Hill support us, but they all kept telling us one thing. There's one thing blocking a congressional investigation. And I said, well, what is that? Mr. Boehner. And again and again and again, even though we did win the congressional investigation, but there's a theme here. Again and again and again, it is Mr. Boehner who seems to be acting contrary to the best interests of the party, of the principles that we stand for. And I can think of no clearer example of betrayal and sabotage than this maneuver right here, just when we are on the verge of retaking the Senate and therefore blocking President Obama's agenda for the rest of his term. And also putting ourselves in a very, very good position to win the presidency in 2016. So, Mr. Boehner, we at American Heartland are asking you to cease and desist. Do not go down this treacherous, destructive road. There's only one thing we want you to focus on, and it's this. And if you do it, and if you succeed in it, we will put you on our shoulders. Secure the border Make sure that it's secure today and for years to come, period. You are listening to the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com lamenting the possible destruction of the Republican Party and upholding values that will never, ever die.
is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Welcome back to American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I'm the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. And this week, I think you were all pressing that fast-forward button during the president's snoozer of a State of the Disunion address. I was dreading it. In fact, my husband has been ill all week, and um, we have uh, cuddled up and watched a couple of movies commiserating together. (laughs) And yet we did take some time to watch the State of Disunion Address, and it was just as dreadful as I anticipated that it would be. And it looks like the American people also agree with me because, by and large, the ratings were horrible. About 33 million people tuned in, which is one of the lowest ratings, one of the lowest amount of people to tune in to a State of the Union address since about the year 2000. There's been a steady decline in interest in the State of the Union address. And that's because, for the most part, it's full of claptrap. And also, if we compare last year's State of the Union with this year's State of the Union, we we saw that so much of what the president said he was going to do, he wasn't able to accomplish. So the State of the Union sounds to Americans like a bunch of blah, 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 and please elect me next year or whenever the next election is. In fact, I said uh, at the time, right as I was listening, this sounds much more like a campaign speech rather than truly the State of the Union. I thought that the president made a couple of very big mistakes because he didn't address directly, forthrightly, what is foremost on everybody's mind. It's almost as though he was giving last year's or the previous year's State of the Union address. Because what I wanted him to talk about is all of the revelations about how our privacy is undermined with the NSA snooping that we know exists in this country. He should be addressing it because that is a national crisis. And he should have addressed in much more detail than he did the tremendous problems going forward with Obamacare and the entire health insurance industry. He talked about that ever so brief, briefly. He gave a defense of his policies. He pointed out to a woman that uh, had a pre-existing condition and benefited greatly from it, et cetera, et cetera. But it was, in my view, wholly unconvincing. And then he went on, the narcissist that he is, to talk about what he's going to do regardless of congressional approval and oversight. He's got his phone and he's got his pen and he's going to use his executive authority to maximize whatever he can on behalf of the agenda that he has laid out. It was overall a display in extreme hubris and arrogance and a lack of touch with the concerns of the American people. Even when he spoke about the economy, he talked about all of the gains that had been made, but he downplayed the very damning statistics the number of people who no longer looking for work because they have given up. So in essence, this president tried to present a rosy colored portrait of America and it fell flat. So much so that many Democrats continue to distance themselves from him. Senate Democrats in particular who are up for election in red and purple states. And they immediately stepped back in many of the commentaries, many of the interviews that they gave. They took a step back from the president, tried to show some distance between their view of things and his. And that shows you how it was essentially a really insignificant speech. The one thing that is significant that does stand out is now this pattern of the imperial presidency, his willingness to exceed the constitutional powers that he has. This is extremely alarming and something we all got to keep a very watchful eye on. 
Now, here you have a president that is on the ropes, that has just delivered an abysmal State of the Union speech. And what is the Republican response? Instead of coming forward, addressing the issues that I've just laid out in front of the American people and highlighting what a failure this administration is, they sent out this representative, Representative McMorris Rogers, a very nice lady by all accounts. She delivered the response and she talked about building a nicer, stronger, sweeter middle class, empowering individuals, etc., etc. I thought that this was another mistake by the Republican Party. Yes, she's a nice lady, but I do not think she hit the right tone. The American people are angry, and we need somebody to express that anger and that frustration. The response should have been a very forceful indictment of the President of the United States. The GOP response should have been something like, My fellow Americans, I stand before you today in shock and dismay at the lies that this president told the American people. We know now clearly and unequivocally that he lied about Obamacare. He lied about the coverage that would be given. He lied about the possibility of keeping one's doctor and keeping one's health care. In addition, my fellow Americans, we know through a Senate, a bipartisan Senate report, that the very foundation of his reelection was built on a lie. He lied about Benghazi. In addition, my fellow Americans, we have yet seen any accountability on the IRS scandal that threatens each and every one of us going forward. Furthermore, there have been some shocking revelations by Edward Snowden about the invasion of privacy, which threatens to undermine each and every one of our liberties. All of these issues and more reveals that this president has failed us. He is embarking on a road of diplomacy with Iran when we should be tough with Iran. He is weakening American power abroad in an alarming way, and he is destroying our Constitution by attempting to use executive power willy-nilly instead of going through Congress to enact legislation. We must remove this man from office as quickly as possible. You see, that's the kind of thing that would have awakened Americans Americans would say, yes, you're speaking for me and my concerns right now. Instead, they're playing on Obama's turf. When you talk about the middle class, you're talking like Obama talks. Don't divide us according to class and race and gender. Talk to us as Americans who share similar concerns regarding our economy, our health, our national defense, and the state of the government. Now, Rand Paul gave a speech on YouTube. He gave his version of a response. And I want you to listen to a couple of snippets of it. One of the first things he says is that if we're going to overcome the economic downturn, we have to understand the cause of that downturn. Roll it, Brittany. Too much government money was given out to too many borrowers who could not afford the payments. Banks were encouraged by government to lend money on houses with no money down. The demand for houses went up and so did their prices, but it was unsustainable. Millions of people lost their jobs. If we don't understand the cause of joblessness, we'll have trouble fixing it. As we entered into the Great Recession, Republicans and Democrats misdiagnosed the problem as too little government, so they gave us more government in the form of bank bailouts and a government stimulus plan. Nearly a trillion dollars later, though, we find that government doesn't create jobs very well. It turned out that it costs nearly $400,000 per job created. Why? Because government is inherently bad at picking winners and losers. In the marketplace, most small businesses fail. If government is to send money to certain people to create businesses, they will more often than not pick the wrong people, and no jobs will be created. 
Think of the half a billion dollars President Obama gave to Solyndra to build solar panels. Turns out people didn't want to buy these solar panels and the taxpayer lost that money. Think of the billions spent on the war on poverty over many decades. Government spending doesn't work. Well, Mr. Paul is on the right track when he identifies as the cause of the problem. But his tone is so deadpan and uninspiring. I mean, where's the passion? Where's the outrage that we Americans feel? If you compare the way that Obama talks versus the way somebody like Rand Paul talks, Obama knows how to inject a lot of emotion. I disagree with his policies, but I can see how he can stir his base and stir his followers. Rand Paul is right but there's no passion, there's no emotion, there's no eloquence. And even when he's talking about something like Solyndra, where's the outrage? And why don't you identify the cronyism that went on, personalize the issue a bit more? He went on to talk about the incredible debt that has uh, been incurred and all of the joblessness in our society. Listen to the next segment. His idea is that we should make it easier to funnel federal dollars back to local governments. I think it would be better not to take the money from the businesses in the first place. We need real jobs created in the real world, not more empty government promises. Under President Obama, the percentage of people working is at its lowest level since the days of Jimmy Carter. Roughly 11 million people are unemployed and millions more have given up looking for work. Our debt has nearly doubled since President Obama entered office and is now over $17 trillion. Our credit rating has been downgraded. Spending continues at unsustainable levels and we're borrowing more than a million dollars every minute. But the numbers tell only half the story. Parents worry about their children going up in a country where good jobs are few and far between. And again, he is dead right in what he says. But where is the outrage? Where is the passion? When he talks about the downgrading of America's credit rating, put that in context. It's the first time in American history that that has happened. And explain to the American people just how bad it is and what that means. Don't just recite a bunch of statistics. People don't relate to statistics. You have to personalize the problem. And that comes from the passion and emotion that you've got to feel as you explain that problem. He then goes on to talk about the reforms that we should enact. Listen to this. Mr. President, where are the jobs? You spent nearly a trillion dollars on make work government jobs and still joblessness confronts the next generation. As a country, all of us together must ask, are we better off when we borrow money from China? Are we better off when we print more money to pass around, hoping no one will notice that the emperor has no clothes? The illusion wears thin. It's time we choose another path. Government spending sounds great, but what good is a welfare program that leaves people embittered, resentful, and trapped, unable to climb into the middle class? What is the virtue in making people feel hopeless, like they can't build a good life in America anymore? Hope and change needs to be more than just a slogan. And he's right once again. And what he should do in a speech is identify somebody, for example, who believed in the hope and change and voted for the president. And tell us about that story and how it went wrong so we can relate to that, emote with that. And he goes on to list all of the things that the Republican Party can do better if they're in power. Roll it, Brittany. Lower taxes, less regulation will entice money and jobs to return home. Americans want opportunity, a chance to work again. I fully believe that most Americans hate the trap of government dependency, but can't break free because big government gives them no exit. I believe a better tomorrow is around the corner if we can see beyond those who entice us with the easy way out. Hard work and sweat invigorate the spirit and provide a solace no government program will ever achieve. We must choose a new way, a way that empowers the individual through education and responsibility to earn a place alongside their fellow Americans in the most prosperous nation ever conceived. 
America has much greatness left in her. We must believe in ourselves, believe in our founding documents, believe in our future, and then we will thrive again. Thank you, and God bless America. You know, again, very well-meaning, but just not good enough. The Republican Party has been talking about lowering taxes, less regulation, less government dependency for years now, and they've not succeeded. Their track record is one also a failure. And unless they can show the American people that they're going to do different than they did before, they're not going to get anywhere. In my view, the Republicans are not capitalizing on the great glaring failures of this president. And I still don't see a leader out there with the courage, the guts, and the eloquence to tell it like it is and outline a specific reform agenda that will smash the federal government and restore the liberties of the American people. You are listening to Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com, upholding values that will never, ever die. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Baby, when they look up at the sky, we'll be shooting stars just passing by. You'll be calling home with me tonight, and we'll be burning out like neon lights. Baby, when they look Welcome back to American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I am the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. Everyone is now talking about 2016. Is Hillary going to run? And what's going to happen on the Republican side? Well, there's a really interesting poll out that says that Mitt Romney leads the Republican field among New Hampshire primary voters for 2016. And so the question is, should Mitt run again? Um, Some people are saying that he's saying he is saying no, 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 and that other people are in a better position than he to run. But if you think about it, he has the staff. He's done the race before, says a reporter in the National Journal. He certainly has the money. And maybe next time around, he can be the person to lead us to victory. And to all of this, I say, absolutely not. No, absolutely not. Let us quash that idea as quickly as we possibly can. And why do I say that? Do I dislike Mitt Romney? No. Do I dislike Ann Romney? No. I really, really like both of them. I think they're decent. I think they're talented. I think they're capable. I think he would have been a brilliant president and she would have made a great first lady. But they lost. They didn't deliver the goods and they cannot deliver the goods. There's a lot of reasons for why they didn't win in 2012. But let's not underestimate a key factor. Mitt Romney did not turn out the conservative base. He was seen as a flip-flopper, as one who had changed his mind on the life issue, as one whose Mormon background didn't necessarily gel with a lot of Christian voters out there, and as one who, having run a blue state, was seen as suspect by many voters. And so why did we lose in 2012? Essentially, Mitt Romney didn't excite enough conservatives. It didn't work once. Why would we waste time and energy trying to do it again? Now, after I heard uh, Senate, uh, Senator Paul's State of the Union response, it occurred to me that I had heard a lot of those themes before. And you know where I heard them? 
in Mitt Romney's speeches throughout the campaign. We want to take you back in time just a little bit, and I want to uh, play some of the clips uh, from Mitt Romney's acceptance speech at the RNC. First, listen to how he was greeted when he finally accepted that nomination after a bruising battle within the Republican Party. Roll it, Brittany. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman and delegates, Mr. Chairman and delegates, I accept your nomination for President of the United States. Well, there was excitement that night, and there was also great jubilation that finally Republicans had stopped ripping each other apart, and we had a nominee at last. Well, he went on to do something that doesn't really work in a a campaign. He went on to try to win based purely on his biography, on his biographical credentials. Roll it, Brittany. The president hasn't disappointed you because he wanted to. The president has disappointed America because he hasn't led America in the right direction. He took office without the basic qualification that most Americans have, and one that was essential to the task at hand. He had almost no experience working in a business. Jobs to him are about government. I learned the real lessons about how America works from experience. When I was 37, I helped start a small company. My partners and I had been working for a company that was in the business of helping other businesses. So essentially, throughout the campaign, Mitt Romney told the American people that he would be like the CEO of the American corporation. He would be as successful in turning around this economy as he had been successful in turning around businesses. He touted his biography, his business credentials. And instead of that being an asset, it was turned against him. He didn't effectively rebut the charges that he had been a ruthless businessman. The Obama campaign lied about that, but nonetheless, it proved to be effective. But more important than not rebutting enough or properly or forcefully, it's not enough to run on a bio. Americans do not elect a president based on their biography, based on their story. That's just one small piece of the pie. Mitt Romney emphasized it over and over again as if to say, I have a business background and I'll be able to fix the economy. The American people, on the whole, didn't buy that. Well, he then tried to take a playbook out of Ronald Reagan, and he did this. Roll it, Brittany. This president can tell us it was someone else's fault. This president can tell us that the next four years he'll get it right. But this president cannot tell us that you're better off today than when he took office. America's been patient. Americans have supported this president in good faith. But today the time has come to turn the page. Today the time has come for us to put the disappointments of the last four years behind us. Well, the problem was the American people had blamed the Republicans in part for the economic downturn. And they thought, well, let's give the president of the United States even more time. There were some factors in the economy that seemed, at least the president was saying, there's some improvement here and there. We can argue about the statistics. But essentially, the president had been saying that when he took office, the economy was in free fall. And though all those things weren't perfect, there was an improvement. We were basically out of crisis. Well... It's true that Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan tried to tell the American people we shouldn't accept this as the new normal. 
But on the whole, it wasn't enough. It wasn't a good enough sales pitch. Why? Because he didn't fully explain what are you as a Republican going to do different than the previous Republicans in office who had contributed to the economic downturn? How different are you really? That was another error. And then he fell into the Democratic trap, which is start to talk about us not as citizens of a great republic, but as people defined by our class. Roll it, Brittany. Many Americans have given up on this president, but they haven't ever thought about giving up. Not on themselves, not on each other, and not on America. What is needed in our country today is not complicated or profound. It doesn't take a special government commission to tell us what America needs. What America needs is jobs, lots of jobs. In the richest country in the history of the world, this Obama economy has crushed the middle class. Family income has fallen by $4,000, but health insurance premiums are higher. Food prices are higher. Utility bills are higher. And gasoline prices, they've doubled. Today, more Americans wake up in poverty than ever before. Nearly one out of six Americans is living in poverty. Look around you. These aren't strangers. These are our brothers and sisters, our fellow Americans. His policies have not helped create jobs. They've depressed them. And this I can tell you about President, where President Obama would take America. Well, there it is. He talked about jobs, jobs, jobs. But what exactly specifically was he going to do to create those jobs? We never really got a clear answer on that. And worse than that, as a campaign error, he fell into the trap of dividing us by class. The middle class is crushed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Since when do we talk about ourselves according to lower class and middle class and richer class and the wealthy and the 1% and the 47% and the this percent and the that percent? This is the class warfare language of the Democratic Party. And we... The grand old party or the conservatives that support the party understand something deeper and more profound. We do not discuss Americans according to what is in their pocketbook. We care about all Americans at all times. We are not and should never be divided by class. And so to the Republican Party, I say stop talking about class. Stop borrowing the rhetoric of class warfare. We don't want it and we don't like it. We care about the poor as much as the middle class and as much as the wealthy. Each of us are entitled to the regard, the protection, the love, the respect of our elected leaders. It doesn't matter what class you're in. We are all Americans. So for all these reasons, as much as I like Mitt Romney and I like Ann Romney, I say categorically no. And I say to the Republican Party, let us learn the lessons of the failed Romney campaign and let us launch a better strategy to win the hearts and minds of the American people. You are listening to Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. And I'm here upholding values that are never, ever going to die. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Welcome 
Welcome back to American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I'm the editor of politics and culture at worldtribune.com. This week, there was no escaping it. Did you see Beyonce and Jay-Z in a really racy number at the 56th Annual Grammy Awards? It was all over the news. If you actually missed the show, you couldn't miss the headlines about it. Well, this week in World Tribune, I have an article It begins with Beyonce and Jay-Z, and then it takes us back in time to other couples who have done the same thing. First, I want to describe what happens. Beyonce, a fabulous pop singer, one, by the way, that I have seen in concert. I think she's stunning. I think she's talented. I think she's quite remarkable. Yet, the performance was horrible. She was in a really scanty outfit, otherwise known as lingerie gyrating on the stage in a way that was extremely provocative. And her husband, Jay-Z, and by the way, it took her six years to get him to put a ring on it. She dated him and since about 2002, and then they got married in 2008, now have a child together. Well, he came out on stage as they sang Drunk in Love together. Roll it, Brittany. If I do say so myself, if I do say so myself, if I do say so myself, hold up, stumbled all in our house, time to back off all of that mouth that you had all in the car, talking about you the baddest chick thus far, talking about you be rapping that dirt, I want to see all the things that I heard, no, I slick Clint Eastwood, hope you can't handle this curse, for playing a four gang, messed up my wall hall, street print right to the side, ain't got time to take dogs off on sight. All right, so the lyrics are really racy. The two are rubbing bodies together. They're talking about their drunken love, and they're talking about their lovemaking, et cetera, et cetera. And at this point, he's even starting to grab, grab some of that rear end. And Beyonce had initially started the song very, very, very provocative moves, provocative poses. I mean, beyond what she has ever, ever done before. And it kept going with these really, really racy, lyrics of how what's how much sexual prowess she has how drunk crazy in love they are it's so crazy it's so wild it's so remarkable and the crowd went crazy too roll it Brittany Oh, and the crowd goes crazy, and here they are celebrating the song, celebrating how beautiful Beyonce is. Oh, this couple, they seem to have it all, right? Time Magazine has once listed them as one of the most powerful couples in Um, in the industry, in the music industry, and all of this to say they obviously have such a passionate, romantic relationship. What is Dr. Grace Voto's take on this? Uh Uh-uh. Marriage is in big, big trouble. Check out my piece in World Tribune because, you see, once you get to be about my age, I'm 43, I've seen this playbook before. Do you remember Kim Basinger, the beautiful uh, model-turned-actress? Well, she married Alec Baldwin, another really dashing actor. And back in the day, they were the talk of Tinseltown, talented, beautiful. He starred with her in a movie called The Getaway. And he showcased how beautiful she was in a very vivid graphic sex scene. And what did this tell us about their relationship? That it was strong and solid and their marriage was good as can be? Uh Uh-uh. They divorced shortly thereafter. 
Another famous couple, Demi Moore and Bruce Willis. So beautiful, so talented, so good looking together on that red carpet. Married for a long time, about 11 years. And although Demi Moore had achieved great success as an actress in movies like um, Ghost, for which she won a Golden Globe and Indecent Proposal and A Few Good Men, she nonetheless decided to go down this road of public nudity, even though she was married and a mom of three. She posed nude on the cover of Vanity Fair, pregnant, seven months pregnant, and that caused a national stir. The year after, she posed nude again, but this time in a bodysuit on Vanity Fair, and that caused another national stir. And then she did a movie strip tease, where in that promo... She was basically in the buff, and the movie was very, very provocative, showing her in various stages of of undress. And what did all this steam and sex appeal mean for the marriage? Uh, went bust. They divorced. Another couple, Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise. Two A-listers, beautiful, talented, remarkable, sexy, everybody said. And what did they do? They appeared in a movie together in 1999, Eyes Wide Shut, steamy sex scene. Everybody was talking about it. What happened to this couple? Divorce shortly thereafter. Another couple, more recent, Mark Anthony and Jennifer Lopez. At the, at, uh, on an American Idol finale, they did a really steamy number on stage, so much so that Ryan Seacrest said, whoa, you know, you've given us a window into how steamy things are at home. What happened to Mark Anthony and J-Lo? Divorced shortly thereafter. And, and last year we talked about Miley Cyrus. Nude here and nude there. Uh, wrecking ball video all naked and uh, so much nudity. What was the undercurrent of all that? She was reeling from the implosion of her relationship with Liam Hemsworth, her fiancé, and eventually that went bust. So what's my take on Jay-Z and Beyonce? They have marital problems. Because if you look at the past, look at this track record, usually when a couple has to go out there in public to, 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 to show to the whole world just how hot and heavy they are behind closed doors, you know one thing. There's not much action going on behind closed doors. And my advice to Beyonce and Jay-Z is this. If you're still married... By next year, the 57th Annual Grammy Awards, stay home and burn those fires at home for the sake of your marriage. Otherwise, you'll end up another statistic in the long, long road of Hollywood and music industry, broken dreams and broken marriages punctuated by nudity and sexual expression that has no place in the public arena. You are listening to a middle-aged, wise, been there, done that, and seen it a couple of times, Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture. Check out my piece on this story at worldtribune.com and listen every week as I uphold values that will never, ever die. Here's what I tell everyone. Born by God's dear grace In an extraordinary place With the stars and stripes And the eagle flies It's a big old land with countless dreams And happiness ain't out of reach Hard work pays off the way it should Yeah, I've seen enough to know that we've got it good The stories that matter, the issues that count This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace